Hey, everybody. Hi. Um, this is Emily Kassane from State Library Services in Roseville, Minnesota. I just wanted to thank you so much for um, attending our webinar this morning. And I'd like to give an extra thanks to um, a couple of organizations because um, this webinar is part of a project I've been working on all year, the National Digital Inclusion Corps, which is a project with um, a, a core member in five states, each of five states. And we've been working on all year on various projects. And the funding uh, was made available through the Institute of Museum and Library Services. It was administered through the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, um, two really great organizations, and I've appreciated the opportunity to work with them and my colleagues in the other states. Um, I'm going to be recording the webinar, so I'm happy to share it with you afterwards. I'll put, it's going to be posted several places, but I'll also send you a link to the recording if you want me to, to send me a message. I'll put my email in the chat function and you can send me a request and I'll send you the link. Um, I noticed a lot of you have muted your lines, but I just wanted to make sure just to remind you of that because we tend to get background noise. And with that also, if you have any technical issues, audio, anything, um, you can put some, a message in the chat and I'll do what I can to, to help you. Um, I'm masquerading as Jennifer Nelson, so if you want to send a private message to me, send it to Jennifer Nelson, just to make it a little confusing. Or you can send it to everybody. Um, we'll be taking questions at the end, but if you um, either if you want to just say it um, or you can put it in the chat or if you have a question as we go along, just put it in the chat and um, I'll flag it for you and we'll talk about it. I also want to thank my co-presenter, um, Susan wittenkamp Brandt, and she will tell you a little bit about herself. Thanks, Susan. Sorry, I just had to unmute myself again, <laughs> start talking. Nobody can hear me. So yeah, my name is Susan wettenkamp Brandt. I am the Educational Technology Manager at the Minnesota Literacy Council. And um, I work under a grant from the Minnesota Department of Education to provide technology training and support and um, implementation of digital literacy standards throughout adult basic education in um, Minnesota programs all over the state. And um, I'm going to be talking about um, some of the aspects of working with ADE that um, librarians might need to know about if they want to start up a successful partnership. Great. Thanks, Susan. So here's just a little agenda of our hour together. Um, I'll talk first about an event we've had here that over the last several years. Then, as Susan said, give some insight into working with uh, libraries, adult basic ed, and workforce, some of our experiences here but it's really applicable um, across the country. So we'll talk a little bit based on our experience with the Better Together program and just experience in general, some characteristics of successful partnerships and some also some challenges. Then we're gonna give a quick um, overview of some tools for getting to a so that we found helpful in our work. And then we'll leave plenty of time for questions and answers. So this um, sort of um, effort or initiative we started called Better Together started a couple of years ago here in Minnesota. We found it often in communities and in our work with different um, stakeholders and organizations that often in the community, in various communities around the state that libraries, adult basic ed, and workforce tended not to work together very much. Sometimes they were aware of each other's existence, sometimes they weren't. Um, sometimes maybe two of the entities work together, but not always all three. They were working with often the same individuals and supporting them, but they didn't necessarily work together to address the common needs of the people that they were working with. And we find, you know, collaboration is a great thing. We just felt that we wanted to pull people together in the various communities um, and from these different organizations. So uh, we came up with the idea for Better Together. And the first year, we had three regional meetings across the state, one in the Twin Cities, one in the northern part of the state, and one in the south. We really encouraged people from, to bring a sort of a three people from the same community, their same community, you know, a library representative, obviously, 
um, an ABE representative and someone from workforce. And if they didn't know each other, um, hopefully we had a couple cases where people didn't know each other, but they happened to come from the same community and they got to know each other at the event. Here's a picture of one of the events that we had. They were really pretty well attended. And they weren't all just lecture style. We had a lot of opportunities for interaction. So our first regional meetings that we had in, in the spring of 2016, we were just really focusing on getting to know each other and learn about what each other does. So we had lots that we built into the day, a lot of opportunities for people to speak with each other and get to know each other. Because like I said, um, some people came to the um, meeting together, other people, other people sort of connected at the meeting. We had also opportunities for people to learn about resources from their other sectors, the other sector partners. So, for example, people in libraries would learn about ABE and workforce tools. ABE would learn about library and workforce tools and so on. We also had, um, through uh, workforce innovation and opportunity grant funds, we had um, enough seed money for some regional collaboration. They were able to apply for, I think there were 11 different regions in the state, and um, they could apply for a $5,000 grant to get some collaboration going. So 10 regions, not 11. <laughs> if I clicked the slide, I would have gotten that number right. Um, so yeah, it was $5,000, which turned out to be just enough. It was, a, it was a manageable amount for people getting projects started. So they were able to keep things at a small, manageable scale. And we found in the 10 grants, people had quite a few different projects um, from pop-up libraries um, at ABE sites. So um, people in adult basic have learned a lot more about what libraries do, and um, ABE's clients learned um, a lot about what their library can do for them, too. We had um, one of the community did bilingual job search classes. We had a lot of a lot of communities which had activities, professional development activities um, for their staff together, and just all kinds of activities. And um, I have a list of the grant projects, so if you're interested in seeing those, I'm happy to email them to you. So then after we had those three regional meetings, uh, we decided we started planning for our next event, and our goal was to inform uh, future directions of North Star. Now some of you may be asking, what is North Star? So right. Um, so Emily, do you want to bring up the over. website? Um, so North Please. Star, um, you may be familiar with it. It is used all over the country now, although it is um, a homegrown in Minnesota project. Um, it is a set of standards for basic computer skills. Across ten different modules, such as Windows operating system and Microsoft Word and things like that, and um, in conjunction with the sets of standards, there are then assessments that um, an individual can go and take and find out um, if they have basic competency in that area, and then um, they'll get an individualized report at the end of the assessment telling them which standards they met and which standards they did not meet. Oh, and they currently require Flash Player, which it looks like Emily doesn't have installed. So uh -huh. it's not for you. Um, we, um, on the North Star Project, are actually currently in process of converting all of the modules over to HTML5. So they won't require Flash and will play better on um, tablets and um, Chromebooks and things like that. Uh, so that project is actually undergoing um, work right now. The first module is um, is out for piloting, and the second one is in the storyboard stage. So those um, will be converted to a more uh, modern format um, in 2018. And Emily, I think our web page has uh, crashed on us. I'm just getting a blank blue screen. Oh, there we go. Now it's back. Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that, everyone. Um, yeah. But a few more things about North Star. Uh, the the modules that you see here on the website that's displayed are free for anyone to just browse and use. 
So if you are in a library setting and um, you have clients coming in who are interested in developing their digital literacy skills but they don't know what they need to, to learn or wh where they should start, uh, you can direct them to North Star. They can take an assessment and they can get a, a printout saying, here are the skills you need to work on. Um, also, um, a program such as an ABE program, Workforce Center, or a library can apply to become a sponsor site. And if they do that and they pay a rather nominal fee to become a sponsor site, uh, you can get uh, detailed reports on how um, test takers at your site are doing, and you can offer proctored assessments, which will then generate certificates um, for your for your client or for your learner, and um, they can then use those to advocate for their skills in a job interview um, kind of situation. So you can see that there are places all over Minnesota listed as uh, sponsor sites, but also um, in other locations. And here's the pricing if you're interested in becoming a sponsor site. So it's always free to the end user. The, the individual test taker pays nothing. Um, it's only a cost for the agency that wants to offer that to their clients. And if anybody has more questions about North Star, I'm happy to answer them. Go ahead and drop those in the chat box at any time. You can go ahead and go back to the slides, Emily. So we had um, in the picture from this North Star discussion event we had on um, this past May, um, National Digital Inclusion Alliance had its National Net Inclusion Conference in St. Paul, um, primarily downtown St. Paul with a lot of um, fun field trips to see digital inclusion um, initiatives across the city. So we uh, piggybacked on that event and the day before we had uh, sort of modified Better Together events. In some ways, they were, it was just this, we had some similar sharing of resources and tools as we did the year before, but we really focused the discussion on what people wanted North Star to look like. So we had um, sort of discussions in the morning and then in the afternoon, people could choose two focus group discussions, one on career pathways, one on college-ready skills, another one on digital literacy in the workplace, and another one on sort of how people could transfer or move on from working with North Star to eventually working in an IT career. So what would the next step after North Star or the next iteration of North Star need to look like so that we could help people go into that um, career path? All right. Thanks for that, Emily. Um, this is Susan again, and I'm going to be uh, giving you a few insights into the world of adult basic education. Um, and the reason I'm doing that is I'm assuming that the majority of folks on this call are from the library um, world. And if that's not true, if you're ABE folks or if you're workforce folks, go ahead and drop a chat in the chat box and let us know about that. Um, but uh, these uh, webinars were um, promoted as a way for librarians to find out about how to strengthen partnerships um, with AD and workers. And so I want to share a little bit about um, the constraints that ADE works under that might be unique um, and not something that um, library or workforce partners really um, are familiar with. So the first thing is uh, WIOA, which uh, Emily mentioned earlier. And if you're not familiar with WIOA, it is the federal act um, from 2014, Workforce Innovation and Opportunity. And it is, the, um, it is the federal legislation that governs adult basic education and workforce. Uh, so whoever um, Marquise is, right, from workforce, you know about WIOA. Um, because it is the funding mechanism for both adult basic education and workforce system. And it sets accountability standards for both of those systems. And 
interestingly, this, this new version of um, our legislation that came out in 2014 strongly emphasizes coordination between workforce and adult basic education. In previous um, forms of the legislation, the two systems worked more in parallel um, and less specifically coordinated or um, connected to, one e to each other. So this um, legislation really encourages workforce and ADE to partner and also, for the first time ever, mentions libraries as recommended partners. So um, it's really important that we move in this direction of greater collaboration because that is what our federal accountability system is looking for. So if you're interested in learning more about WIOA, we have the link there um, if you want to find out about the legislation and what it entails. Go ahead to the next slide. So the, the thing about trying to develop partnerships is that the, the different systems are um, conceptualized very differently across our state, and I would assume this is true in other states as well. So even the service areas may not have the same boundaries. Um, there may be existing collaborations um, in some communities, but not in others. And although the populations that we serve across the different um, agencies are very similar, they're not completely overlapping. So um, libraries serve the largest um, potential population, which is pretty much anybody in the community. So anyone in the community can walk into a library and receive services. Workforce has a very specific mandate to help people find jobs. So um, bringing people into the labor force and serving clients who have been laid off or who um, need assistance finding a better job. And then adult basic education serves an educational system, right? So we're talking about people who have basic skill needs. You can't receive services through adult basic education if you don't have an educational skill development need. So that means you come in, we give you a math or a literacy test, and we find out that you have below 12th grade reading or below 12th grade math, and we say, yes, you're eligible for services. But if you don't have skills below those levels, then we can't serve you. You're not eligible. And also, you can't come in strictly for digital literacy um, services you have to have a math or a literacy or an English language learning objective um, in order for us to serve you. Go ahead to the next slide, Emily. Um, so a few of the other things um, to keep in mind if you're working with an adult basic education partner is our funding source. So funding is provided to adult basic education differently than K-12. So in K-12, um, a school district is provided funding based on enrollment. So you, have, you serve a, a certain number of students during the school year and you get a, um, a fixed amount of funding per student. In adult basic education, it's not like that. We are reimbursed for services that we provide based on contact hours. So a student comes to a class, attends for two hours, and those two hours generate a fixed amount of funding. So in order for an adult basic education provider to offer a class, we need to keep the roster and the attendance high enough so that we can generate enough funding to pay for the teacher. So that's different than you might have in a library setting or a workforce setting where um, the funding is not a direct reimbursement for attendance in the class. Um, if, if attendance drops below a certain level in a class, um, you may continue it if you feel that it's serving a need in the community. But in adult basic education, it becomes very difficult because you can't afford to pay the teacher. Um, another thing to keep in mind that's very different from um, libraries and um, but is very similar to workforce, 
is that we do have accountability measures that we need to meet. Um, and that means that we need to test people and we need to collect data. So uh, we are an education provider um, and we have a mandate to make sure that people are improving their literacy, math, and English language skills. Um, the way that we document that is through standardized testing. And so we need to show that people are improving their skills. We cannot offer tests to students until they have completed enough instruction to be, um, in, to be eligible to take another test. So another important feature of working with an adult basic education provider is that we need to retain our students for at least 40 hours of instruction. So a model um, in an adult basic education system is going to want to have um, enough services per week that students can get to 40 hours relatively quickly. It's very difficult for an adult basic education provider to offer a class that only meets, let's say, for one hour a week because you'd have to have 40, hour, or 40 weeks of instruction um, before you could test that person again. And um, it's unlikely that people are going to stick around for 40 weeks most people stop out before that. So we want to keep the, the frequency of service higher than that so that we can retain people to 40 hours. Um, we also need to um, demonstrate that um, people who go through our programming are improving their employment outcomes. And that um, means that we need to collect Social Security numbers because the employment outcomes are um, documented through data matching with uh, workforce data, and so the data match is done on a Social Security number. So we do need to request Social Security numbers um, from students who enroll in our programs, which is obviously very different from what you would expect in a library setting. I know that libraries highly emphasize student or client privacy, and they don't want to ask for that kind of data. But if you are partnering with an ABE program, know that your um, participants will be um, asked for their social security numbers. Uh, the students are not required to provide one, but we are required to request it. So um, they can say, I'd rather not share that with you, but we do have to ask. And then um, in addition to that, a lot of digital literacy work is done um, through grant funding. And of various types, you might have something like the Wilder Foundation or um, maybe Wells Fargo um, that's funding a new project, and they're going to want to show that um, you are serving their target population. So um, a grant funder might be interested in serving low-income uh, minority households in Hennepin County. Well, how do we prove that our our um, services are providing um, for low-income minority households. We're going to have to ask race and we're going to have to ask income. Otherwise, we can't um, justify our grant application to the grant funder. So um, a lot of times we're going to be asking for a lot more data than um, you would see in a, a typical library program. And another thing to keep in mind is that digital literacy is not what we would call core content. Um, so core content is what we are mandated to provide, which is math and English language arts and um, English language for those who speak another language. And we do um, provide digital literacy instruction incorporated into our primary instruction. Um, and we can offer separate standalone digital literacy classes as well, but they have to be supplementary. So a person would be co-enrolled in both classes. We can't offer a standalone digital literacy class for people who don't um, attend other classes. All right, go on to the next slide, Emily. Can I ask, someone had a question? Um, yeah, sure. Just about this slide. Is, is the 40 hours mandated by federal funding or is there some other reason for that requirement? That is um, required by um, the federal 
uh, agency, yes. Um, previously, it was only, um, I would say, a recommendation, but um, a few years ago, there was an audit of Minnesota's adult basic education program by our federal agency, and um, one of the things that they um, felt Minnesota needed to do better was um, make sure that students received significant instruction before um, receiving another test. Um, and so it became mandatory after that audit. And I don't know if it is mandatory in other states, although it certainly would be recommended in other states. And if your state were to go through the same audit process that we went through, it's likely that they would um, institute the same requirement. Does that answer your question? Yes, it looks like it does. But um, if you want to follow up, yes, she said yes. OK, good. Great. Thanks. Yeah. So another thing that just keep in mind as you're working with different partners is um, the terminology that we use when we describe um, individuals that we're serving. Um, in libraries, you might refer to someone as a patron. Is that a student, a client, a customer? What terminology um, is familiar in your work environment it might be very different from your partners. So just becoming familiar with the terminology they use is helpful. And then also thinking about what does low literacy or limited English mean. Um, so one of the examples is uh, one of the partners in the Better Together um, group came together um, with their workforce partner. And um, the adult basic education provider told the workforce provider, um, we'd love to have you come in and do some uh, job search classes at, for our um, English learners. And they have you know, limited English. So please make the materials um, accessible to someone with limited English. And the workforce provider said, yep, great, we can do that. And they, they sent over their curriculum materials. And the curriculum materials were at a sixth to eighth grade reading level, which is what they thought limited English meant. And the sixth to eighth grade is far, far above the high end of our English language learners, right? The majority of our English language learners are reading at a third or fourth grade at the best. Um, so their materials were far too high for a level of English for our clients. So um, we needed to have a conversation about what low literacy or limited English meant. Um, what it meant to us was not the same thing as what it meant to the workforce partner. So there was a lot of, um, of learning going on through that partnership about the, the kinds of individuals that we serve in our programs. So just thinking about that as you serve individuals, when the person says, this, this person doesn't speak English well, what does that mean? Um, in some contexts, that might mean they um, aren't particularly fluent or they have an accent. In other contexts, it might mean they know 500 words in English. So just clarifying that is really helpful as you're developing materials with your partner. Go ahead on to the next slide, Emily. All right, and then um, a few examples of successful partnerships um, that we saw in Minnesota, um, some through the Better Together grant and some others. Um, uh, there's a process in Minnesota called a conditional work referral that is a partnership between workforce and adult basic education where we can bypass those testing requirements that I was talking about earlier. So if a client comes into a workforce center and says, I need digital literacy skills, um, but they don't have a reading or a math or a language um, goal, the workforce center can find a referral for that person to adult basic education to receive digital literacy instruction and bypass the testing and the, the um, standard co-enrollment requirements. There are restrictions on how many hours you can count for that person. You can only serve them for up to 30 hours of instruction, after which you would have to enroll them as a standard student. Um, but it is an option for um, people who are looking to partner with workforce. Um, individuals who 
has seemed to work better than teacher-fronted classes for the majority of our digital literacy efforts, um, and that is because people come in with widely varying digital literacy skills. So in a workforce sense, center or um, a library setting, you have people coming in looking for digital literacy skills, and some um, have never used a computer before, don't know how to use the mouse, and others are wanting to learn how to do Excel, right, so that, or who need to write a resume. So what does digital literacy mean to different people is widely varying. Um, and in that situation, it's very hard to do a teacher-led, everybody's learning the same thing at the same time kind of class because everyone is, is coming in so um, differently. So individual tutoring in a facilitated lab has seemed to work better. Um, so we have a volunteer coordinator who places tutors, um, matches them up um, with individual learners who are each learning, working on an indiv individualized learning plan. Um, and another uh, promising practice here in Minnesota is partnering with um, our AmeriCorps CTEP program. Um, and CTEP is a community technology empowerment program. They're located here in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and they place uh, service members through AmeriCorps in libraries and community centers and, um, and uh, other nonprofit agencies. Uh, to do digital literacy work with both youth and adults. Um, and so they have an emphasis on um, bridging the digital divide and bringing um, particularly low income and minority um, populations into the digital age. So it's a great opportunity if you are in Minnesota to, um, to connect uh, with a service member um, you can apply to be a host site on their website, which is um, linked here. So if you get the slides from Emily, you can um, go check out their website and uh, find out how to apply to be a host site for AmeriCorps. And All right, this is going to turn it over to you, Emily. Let anybody, if you have any questions, drop me a chat. Right. Um, Reflecting back on our experience with Better Together, um, and especially with the grant project, uh, we did notice some challenges. Um, and I don't know whether this was a regional thing or a state thing, but we found that workforce partners tended not to be as highly engaged as libraries and adult basic ed. We found this to be true in the attendance for events, and we tried publicizing them various ways. Um, State level people, were, um, administrators were encouraging uh, field staff to go to the events um, and how they were really participating in a wonderful way. But we found that it was not uniform across the regions. And it was, of all the three partners, it was a bit of a challenge to get them to be involved. And I think in sort of pre existing partnerships, uh, it was most common to have libraries yes. and adult basic ed working together. And it could be that that was, um, you know, libraries in a lot of cases maybe used to working with school districts. I don't know what the reason was, um, but it was something that we're continuing to work on. Um, we really did focus on relationship building, and but you have to focus on what the existing relationship is like. Uh, before introducing a new project. So if there was some sort of existing dynamic in the relationship, you know, maybe they worked, <laughs> tried working together 10 years ago and something happened, um, they're going to need to work through that uh, before they introduce a new project and, you know, have a fresh start. Um, that was just an interesting, I think that's true for a lot of relationships and a lot of projects. You just want to make sure you are understanding the history of working together and making sure you start out with as healthy a dynamic as possible. I also need to make sure that direct staff and administrators are in agreement with why you're doing it, uh, how you're going to do it, and not to mention do we need to do it at all. Sometimes it's the direct service staff who are really, really, really ready to go and it's hard for them to get buy-in from the administrators, and they, and they do need to have that buy-in, obviously, for it to work well. Sometimes the administrators were, you know, we really need to do this, this is why, um, and direct staff weren't really, really ready to buy-in. 
there needs to be clear communication between the two about basic things like how does this fit into what we're doing, how does this serve our clients, um, how are we going to do it, the timeline, all of that. It's great, you know, you need to have clear communication and agreement on it for this project to succeed. And then obviously change. Change is difficult, particularly for large organizations. Um, so you have to really, from that onset, feel, you know, see small and see incremental change as a positive thing. See things moving in the direction you want to go, see that as, as positive. Um, if someone uh, is resistant initially and you slowly change their mind so that they want to work on the project, see that as a success. Um, but realize that change is difficult. Um, the speed of change isn't always, or the you know implementation, speed of implementation isn't always at the pace that you'd like it to be. Um, but if you see incremental change as a victory, um, you'll eventually get there. And back to Susan. All right. Um, I just realized I had forgot to mention something on my previous slide when I was talking about uh, the CTEP program. That is an uh, AmeriCorps state program, so it's only available in Minnesota. But um, there may be other state AmeriCorps programs in your area, so it wouldn't hurt to investigate um, if you are not in Minnesota to find out what um, state AmeriCorps programs are available in your area. Uh, because not all AmeriCorps projects are nationwide, many of them are state um, specific. So you may have something else like that in your area, even if you are not um, in Minnesota and eligible for CTEP. Sorry about that. Um, so moving ahead, thinking about uh, tools and resources. Um, so we already mentioned uh, the North Star, which is now um, linked here so you can see the URL for that. Um, so that has the standards and the assessments. Um, and then the thing about North Star is that it is not a curriculum. It is a set of standards, what people need to learn, and then assessments, have they learned it. But there's no um, learning uh, materials specifically associated with North Star. So uh, one of the sponsor sites, uh, the St. Paul Public Library, who have been instrumental in putting North Star together, in, including actually um, uh, acquiring the initial funding for the modules to be developed, um, they use it heavily and they wanted to organize learning materials for their library patrons who um, were coming to take assessments. And they developed a learning guide. The link is um, here. And that learning guide um, lists out all the different modules and every standard. And for every standard, there are two, three, or four learning resources linked um, on the guide that the person can study independently. So um, it pulls the best of the web from YouTube and other um, and text-based uh, and tutorials and all kinds of different learning resources um, organized by the standard. And so what you can do as uh, a person who's studying to um, get your North Star assessment done is you, you go through the assessment, you find out what skills you need to work on, it tells you specifically which standards, and then you can come to the guide and you can find those specific standards and matched with learning resources. So it's been a great resource um, and the librarians in St. Paul do a, a wonderful job um, keeping it up to date and making sure that the materials are relevant. Go ahead to the next slide there. Um, if you're not uh, using North Star specifically, but you're just doing um, overall digital literacy work. Um, you might be interested in some other uh, tools that um, be helpful for studying. Um, if you are not familiar with Digital Learn, that is also a library project. Um, it has a series of really great short online tutorials on a variety of digital literacy topics. Um, and then GCF Learn Free, which is um, a nonprofit agency, um, and they have comprehensive uh, digital literacy tutorials on practically any subject you can imagine. Um, they are intended for adult learners, they have no advertising, and they um, 
are written at a fairly simple level, I would say approximately fourth to fifth grade reading level, so possibly beyond the level of an English language learner to um, work with, uh, but should be accessible to most um, English speaking adults. Uh, they also have tutorials and videos on their site that um, make it more helpful for people who are learning English. Um, but they have all kinds of topics, um, including every version of Windows you can want to use, Google tools, Twitter, social media, anything you might want to learn, you can probably learn it at GCF Learn Free. I really like their services. Great. Um, and then this last one is actually a CTEP project. So I was just mentioning CTEP. Um, and along with uh, directly serving individual students, CTEP also uh, develop curriculum materials uh, for teaching. And uh, one of the projects they've done recently is this website where they have done something similar to what the St. Paul Public Library did with their library guide, but they um, develops their own website with a truly clean interface that's easily navigatable by a person with limited digital literacy and limited literacy. So it's highly icon-based, very limited text, um, much more simple to navigate. So if you're looking for something for true beginners, uh, the digital homeroom from CTEP is a really great place to start. And if we have some time at the end of the session, we can go pop in and look at any of those websites. Go ahead, Emily. All right, I think it's time for questions, or we can go ahead and look at any of those websites if you'd like. Yeah, to ask a question, um, feel free to drop something in the chat box. Also, feel free to just speak up. We're not a huge group. Oh, and also at the bottom of the slide where we have our, obviously our contact information, also uh, links to handouts we had at the Better Together event. I'm uh, really happy to share the slide deck with you if you'd like. I put my email in the chat. Um, you can ask away and I can also send you a link to the recording. So Susan, do you want to go back, since we don't have any questions at the moment, to which one of the sites? Which you think you want to talk about? Susan, did you want to um, Sorry, I was nice. muted again. <laughs> I said, <laughs> I almost did that last time, so. uh, Yeah, you can go ahead and just open each of them, I think, in turn. Okay, I'm going to copy. Okay. Bear with me a second. I'm going to try a different browser. There we go. Are you seeing the? Uh... I'm seeing inside MDE. <laughs> Here we <Okay>. go. <laughs> there you go. I don't want to share agency secrets with anybody. <laughs> so, good. Yep. So if you just want to scroll down a little bit so we can see more on the page. So they have some pretty well organized here on Digital Learn into um, important categories. So if you open up something like uh, intro to email, let's just take a look at that one. 
Um, a couple of things I like in particular about digital learn is they tell you exactly how long um, it should take, what level it's at, how many activities there are, and um, oftentimes there are also printable materials that are associated with these. So if you scroll down, um, Emily, I think you should be able to find the link for printing the materials. So each of these has oh, sorry. interactive tutorial. Oh, you're good. Okay. And then um, I think at the bottom of each one, there should be a printable materials. Yep. So there are also PDFs that you can take um, and print out. So um, if you're using this in a class, you could have um, materials for folks to take home as well and study as well as do online. So these are very well done and um, very accessible. told you about GCF Learn Free, but um, they have lots of different learning materials here, but uh, technology is, I think, their real strong suit. If you open that up. And then scroll down a little bit, Emily. So they have major categories um, of different topics, but you can also just search for a topic. Say you open up one of those modules. Scroll down. And then you can see there's a whole series of different activities in there. Including videos, text, interactive activities lots of different learning modalities within their um, tutorials. And then this is the digital homeroom from the CTEP. So you can see that they have um, really tried to clean up the interface and make it as simple to use as possible. And they also have emphasized vocabulary, which is important um, not just for English language learners, but for um, people who are new to using computers, even if they speak English. There's a lot of jargon for people to learn, so vocabulary is um, a component of the CTEP. As you see, they may link back to Digital Learn or GCF Learn Free, but um, the interface is um, designed to be as simple to use as possible to get people to exactly the information they um, are looking for. Does anybody have on the call have um, a favorite uh, digital literacy learning resource that they'd like to share? I'm always looking for recommendations of other great services. If you know something, uh, go ahead and uh, just call it out on the phone or uh, drop it in the chat. Yeah, feel free to chat or if you want to just, yeah, shout out favorite sites, uh, any questions that you have about things we've covered? And, we should set. and uh, just a reminder, I'm happy to send you the link to the recording. Um, 
or to the slide deck. I'm happy to share that with you. We also have the handouts for Better Together, which give a lot of partner organizations shared materials. So that's a good resource. Ah, somebody said they like Mouser Size from Palm Beach Libraries. Yes. I think Mouser Size is probably one of the um, materials that's linked on the library guide. Um, if you go to the North Star and you are um, needing help with mouse skills specifically, I'm pretty sure they link to this one. Yeah. I will never forget when I first used the mouse, I kept, it took me about two days to not move it the opposite direction of the way it was supposed to go. I'm not exactly <laughs> sure why I had that problem, but I could have used mouse <laughs> and I was Probably rewiring because, my brain. Because you're used to looking into a mirror, right? Where you would do yeah. the opposite, right? I think that's why. Oh. A lot of people have that problem. That's also why, well, one of the many reasons I fail at group exercise classes, because I am a person who does go the opposite way of everybody. So that's a great, thanks for that. Does anyone else have a resource that they'd like to share? Or a question? Well, thanks so much for joining us this morning. We really appreciate it. Um, please feel free to follow up with Susan and or me. Um, if you have ideas about resources we should feature in the future, we'd love to hear about that too. And with that, we'll end this webinar that we hope to keep the conversation going. Thanks so much.